hypothesis. The first type of study is the randomized trial, also called the randomized clinical trial, because it's often used in testing new therapies. What is the design shown here? We begin with a study population, and we randomly assign the members of that population, in this slide, to a current treatment or to a new treatment. We then follow up both groups of patients, determine how many die from the disease in the current treatment, and how many dies from the, die from the disease in the new treatment. If the new treatment is more effective than the current treatment, we would expect to see fewer people dying from the disease who receive the new treatment than receive the current treatment. So the design of the randomized trial is basically a simple one, and it's a very desirable type of study. Let's turn to the issue of breast implants and connective tissue disease which has received great attention. If we wanted to carry out a randomized trial of breast implants, we would identify a population of women who would be randomly assigned to receive breast implants or not receive implants, and then the both groups would be followed to determine what percent of each group develops connective tissue disease. Clearly, this diagram represents a hypothetical because we could never carry out such a study. We would never get women to cooperate. We could not do it for ethical reasons. And so it is really a totally theoretical design because a randomized trial can be carried out only when we are looking at a potentially beneficial intervention. If we have a toxic or potentially toxic substance or a putative carcinogen, clearly we cannot randomize human populations to receive that type of agent. Nevertheless, the randomized trial is often considered the gold standard, the, the standard of truth that we try to emulate even in other types of study design. If we're not able to randomly assign people, we have the following type of study called a cohort study, a defined population not randomly assigned self-selects or is assigned by other people to exposure or non-exposure. People, for example, may work in a certain industrial plant. Others seek jobs in another plant. And then we follow up people who have the exposure and people who don't have the exposure and look at the rate of disease in both groups. If indeed the exposure is related to disease, we would expect to see a greater number of people with disease in the exposed group than in the non-exposed group. Sometimes when we approach this type of study, we may just focus on this part of the diagram. Instead of beginning with a defined population, we begin with exposed and non-exposed people. Indeed, this is what is most often done in occupational studies, where we compare people who are working in one industrial plant with people who are not employed there. So what we're talking about is the cohort study, also called a prospective study. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. This slide shows that in a cohort study, we begin with exposed people and compare them to non-exposed people. This is the hallmark of a cohort study. We then ascertain what proportion of both groups develop the disease in question. If exposure is associated with disease, we would expect that a greater number of exposed people will develop the disease than do non-exposed. This is the straightforward rationale of the cohort design. And if we apply this to the issue of silicone breast implants, we would identify women who've had implants, compare them to women who've not had implants, and look at the development of connective tissue disease in both groups. And if implants are indeed associated with the development of connective tissue disease, we would expect to see a greater proportion of the implant group developing connective tissue disease than of the non-implant group. So we've now talked about the randomized trial and about cohort studies. And the final study I'll discuss in this presentation is the case control study. In the case control study, we begin with people who have the disease, called cases, and we identify people who don't have the disease for comparison, and they are called controls. 
hence the name case control study. We then determine the history of exposure. What proportion of people with the disease were exposed in the past and what proportion of people without the disease were exposed in the past. If exposure is indeed associated with disease, we would expect a greater proportion of the cases to have had a history of exposure than of the controls. Again, let's look at the implant question. If we were doing a case control study of implants, we would first identify a group of women with connective tissue disease and a comparison group without connective tissue disease. We would then determine what proportion of the women with connective tissue disease have a history of receiving implants compared to women without connective tissue disease. And if exposure is associated with disease, we would expect a greater proportion of the women with the disease, the cases, to have had exposure than of the women without the disease, the controls. So what we've seen up to now is basically three major types of study design that are used in epidemiologic studies. Randomized trials, generally not used for putatively toxic agents, but case control or cohort studies that are used to explore the relationships of exposure to a specific disease. 